two million websites. Um, I always let you know that because I'm in sales, um, and so it feels important uh, as we we want to get started on the right foot. So if we think about design and development skill, um, we have all of you. Uh, who's a lot of you guys from Vancouver, from the area? Okay, we have a lot. Of, we have all of you. We have a gap the size of Lionsgate Bridge, and then we have me. So uh, I'm not a design and development professional. I, I like WordPress. I work very hard with WordPress to build my own hobby sites and things like that. Um, but I'm not a designer. And I bring that up because most of you will, will find the colors in the presentation to be grading uh, and, and offend your UX and UI sensibilities. So I just want to make sure that you guys understand it's not my fault. Uh, I'm in sales because I can't design, right? So um, it was either teach or sales, and I, just, I chose sales. So, uh, anyway, um, I was asked recently uh, what drew me to WordPress, how I got into WordPress, what I do with WordPress, uh, and the reality is this, I actually worked in managed services, uh, just generalized IT services for a while, and um, there's a guy named Jason Cohen, who some of you guys may know, who founded WP Engine, and I've been reading his blog for 10 or so years, I read it as I built my own business, uh, sort of saw him as an online mentor, somebody I would always try to look and read his blog, and then when I found out WP Engine was hiring, I went to work for him. Um, so for full transparency, I didn't uh, go to work in WordPress because I love WordPress. I went to work because I really like Jason. Uh, but over time, uh, I, I grew to love WordPress and to understand what it could mean, um, not just to the internet itself, but, but really to the future. I, I really believe that we're just getting started on what the internet can be. Uh, I think the WordPress community is going to be uh, the leaders in helping decide what technology looks like for the internet of things. Um, I wouldn't presume to know, but five years from now, will there even be URLs? Um, will everything be app-based? Will it be, like Matt Mullenweg says, will it all be tied into APIs? Uh, and so I'm enthusiastic about WordPress because I think that that's where the greatest uh, width and depth of expertise around what the internet is going to look like, that it exists with WordPress. And so I enjoy going to WordCamps. I enjoy speaking to people that work in WordPress. Uh, I work with a lot of CMS, uh, different CMS as you might imagine. Um, and Media Temple, anything you can put online, we're happy to host. So I don't just exclusively work with WordPress, but but I do believe that WordPress is the tip of the spear on what's going to happen with the internet, and I'm excited about that. So um, since I can't design or develop very well, at least, um, what I can share is some ideas about sales and about how to grow businesses, um, small, large, medium size. Um, there's a few things that, that I run into on a daily basis, as you might imagine. Um, with the number of clients we have at Media Temple and with my own experience in the community, I've yet to have anybody say, you know, like, we've got our sales equation solved. Um, we actually have a team of people at Media Temple whose job, uh, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, is to try to figure out the math of sales. Try to figure out, okay, where do we spend the money here? What do we do there to grow a business? So I can certainly empathize with how difficult it is if you're a freelancer or a hobbyist or have a two or three or five or 15 or 25 person shop. Um, where's that next piece of business coming from? Where's that next lead coming from? So the point here uh, of what we're going to try to do in the next 55 minutes, hour, is to sort of solve that equation uh, and do it in as painless of a way possible. Um, my experience has been, and I think you guys can, can empathize with this, is if, if you're a developer or designer and you're doing the work hands on keyboards, any minute that you're out trying to sell and grow your business is a minute away from doing the work. But every minute that you're doing the work is a minute that you're not growing the business. And the reality is building up to where I've got a salesperson, I've got business development reps, I've got marketing, I've got this engine that's running, is really hard to do um, because it's a chicken or the egg issue. Like You want to do great work behind the keyboard for somebody, um, but every minute that you're doing that, you're missing out on opportunities with other potential clients. So it's, it's really a problem of balance, um, of finding that equilibrium that you can have to say, I'm spending this amount of time actually on the business, and I'm spending this amount of time doing the work. Who here has read uh, E-Myth Revisited or any of the E-Myth books? A few of you? Okay. It's really, it's really a, a good series. I'd encourage everybody to read it, maybe 150, 200 pages. Uh, if you're like me, you can finish that in like six or seven months. And um, <laughs> it really talks about what it means to, to work on your business itself and not just do the work that's within the business. That you have to understand that there's a forest and there's also the trees. So, so right now, I'd imagine, um, you guys probably throw different lines in the water to figure out how are we going to generate more business, how are we going to get more work for whether you're a one-person shop or multiple. In fact, let me ask, how many of you are freelancers? Just it's you by yourself. Okay, good. The vast majority of people. So that sort of applies. It's like 
you know, where is that new business coming from? I'm sure that for many of you, probably the top source or one of the top sources historically is going to be referrals. It's going to be people that are happy with the work you did. It's going to be somebody that you met at a picnic. It's going to be somebody like, I know Greg, he does web design. My buddy needs a website. I'm going to put him in touch with Greg. So just simple referrals. Content marketing is a new thing. Uh, anybody out there written any eBooks, white papers, anything trying to push? Yeah, it's a, it's awesome. Uh, my experience in writing in writing white papers is that I learn a lot more from them than the audience that I don't have. So, uh, but it can be useful. Um, existing clients go back to the well. Hey, I noticed you guys need. You know, this plugin is outdated. Uh, did you update WordPress core? You got you just acquired a new company. We need to make an announcement. You go to existing clients. Affiliate programs, how many people uh, out there have affiliate program memberships? If you don't, you should. Even if it's not with Media Temple, uh, particularly with hosting providers, some of them pay really, really generously. Um, and and uh, Rainmaker pays very generously, WP Engine pays very generously, ours is pretty good. Um, you can go to, um, what's it, um, Commission Junction, there's a lot of places where if you're, if you're publishing blogs, if you're doing that content marketing, it can be a place to make uh, it, even a little bit of extra money with very, very little uh, interaction. Um, networking events, you're at WordCamp, you go to meetups, kind of looking like, hey, I want to talk shop with people, see if there's a way that we might work together. Um, SEO, we're now to the part where, to me, at least it's a little bit of a black art. I have no idea how SEO works, neither does anyone else. Um, <laughs> we certainly are trying. Um, uh, Pay-per-click, how many, how many of you have, I, just show of hands if you're not too embarrassed, how many of you have spent money on pay-per-click? Okay, very few, very smart crowd, good. Um, yeah, the, the return on pay-per-click is very small for, for developers and designers. And, and then my favorite is social media, which I'm not entirely sure uh, what that means. Uh, I do it too, but it's like, I'm going to tweet, I'm going to post my work on Instagram. Um, and if it works for you, great. My, my view is that Kim Kardashian markets on social media, uh, smaller shops, myself included, like that's, it's really hard to cut through the noise. So, so what do we do um, to actually solve that? Like I said, we're trying to solve the equilibrium between your time doing the actual work and your time building the business, but we're also trying to find a repeatable process that works. Um, that's the thing, right? Uh, sales is always, there's always a math to sales. I'm in a fortunate position because I've got a team of people that are trying to help us find the formula of how many calls does it take, how many emails does it take, how many lectures, uh, content marketing, et cetera, how much does that take at the top of the funnel to spit out what at the bottom? Um, that is a luxury that the vast majority of people, particularly if you're developing on your own, you just do not have, have the opportunity to do that. So we need to find a repeatable process that works, but also one that's not so terribly complicated, but also unfun, that it makes the fact that you're excited about being a freelance developer, you're excited about WordPress, that it doesn't become a burden to look up and be like, oh gosh, you know, 90 minutes a day, three hours a week, I've got to do this business development stuff, and it sucks. Nobody wants that. Um, this should be fun, the work is fun, there's no reason that sales and building a pipeline and, and building your business can't be fun as well. So my experience has been that most developers have capacity, meaning that if there's interesting work to be done, they'll find a way to get it done. Um, it's not about more hours, it's about more efficiency, you've heard all those things. I guarantee you with each and every one of you, if I was to say, hey, here's this project and it's in your wheelhouse and it pays right, you would find a way to get it done. You'd say, you know what, that's, that's worthwhile, I want to spend the time on that. So capacity is not a problem. We also find that desire is not a problem. Uh, even if you're a hobbyist, even if it's something that you want to spend just a few hours a week or even a few hours a month doing, um, you know, you have a desire to get better at the work. You have a desire to work on interesting and meaningful things. I think at least in part, some of you share my enthusiasm for what the internet is going to look like in time. Uh, and it's a lot of fun to shape that. So uh, it's not a question of desire. And it's certainly not a question of ability. Um, there was a guy named Brandon Dove that works for Pixel Jar in Orange County, has this great saying to people at WordCamp who ask, uh, how do I get involved? I don't feel like I know anything. Uh, he says, well, show up, wait five minutes, and then look over your shoulder and there's somebody even newer than you. Um, you guys have a lot more expertise and ability than you may even give yourselves credit for. Uh, it's not a question of ability. The, the vast majority of the populace still at this point is in awe of the simple things that you can do. Simply installing WordPress, putting in a theme, typing in the name, like uploading a picture of a cat or something, people are like, magic, how did you do that? So give yourselves credit. You do have the ability. Uh, you certainly have the desire. You certainly have the capacity. So we just need to solve finding interesting work to do uh, around that. What I do find that most developers lack is business rigor. And the reason that most developers lack business rigor is that no one on earth likes business rigor. 
uh, it's this sort of nebulous term for process and structure and organization and putting a certain amount of time on the calendar every day and I'm going to do this or setting a calendar reminder to tweet that or um, writing a blog post. The things, it, the things that if you have to remind yourself to do them are probably a waste of time, right? Uh, one of the things that I find in sales, not just with web hosting or with web development or anything else, is that people, uh, no one likes to be sold, but everyone likes to buy. And so a lack of authenticity, a lack of being genuine uh, is really the death knell for your sales efforts. So if you are forcing yourself to blog, if you are forcing yourself to network events, uh, then I, I'm here to tell you you are just wasting your time. People will see right through that and you should go take that time and do something. You hang out with your kids, go for a hike, just don't do something that, that comes across as, uh, as not genuine because everybody knows and, and you're making yourself unhappy. So um, we should hack that. We should find a way to circumvent business rigor and make sure that our marketing activities, the things that we want to do to build our business, whether you were looking for one more client a year or whether you were looking for five or ten clients uh, that have the phone ringing off the hook, we should find a way to do that, uh, like I said, in a way that is not painful, uh, a way that doesn't make you hate the fact that you ever got involved with web development or design in the first place. So the first thing that we're going to do um, around that, and this is a sort of exercise that you can try now or try at home, um, is understanding what business you are in. Um, it's been my experience that most developers and designers, I'm sort of shorthanding the web world when I say devs, most developers and de designers are in the AFAB business. You may know what that is. Anything for a buck. <laughs> I mean, they're, in, they're in the yes business. I'm a sales guy, I'm in the yes business. You tell me what you need, I say yes, and then I go have my friend Jay over there, take it back to the mothership and see if we can do it. But I'm in the yes business. You guys shouldn't be in the yes business. You shouldn't take on work that is uh, just because you were counting on the revenue or just because you have the time. That's another good way to hate the fact that you ever got involved in this in the first place. If you're doing uh, you know, migration after migration after migration after migration and QAing somebody else's links and making sure the plugins work, if that is a passion of yours, that's fantastic. I would bet you the first drink tonight that that is not a passion of yours. <laughs> no one likes to do that work. You should find the thing um, that puts you in a position to not be in the anything for a buck business because the most successful developers I know, and I know quite a few, um, are, sect are specific uh, to a sector or a certain activity. I'll give you a couple examples. Oh, here in just a second. First, why specialization matters. Would anyone wager a guess of how many web professionals there are uh, out there? And by web professional, I mean people that in this calendar year are going to receive some form of payment, some sort of revenue, for doing some work for someone else on the internet. This includes all of you. This includes shops of 50 or 100 or 1,000 people. It includes Leo Burnett. It includes RGA. It includes SEO firms. People that are doing work for other people online who have a digital strategy. How many of them do you think that there are? Somebody wager a guess. 100 million. 100 million. OK, well, that's a little high. Um, <laughs> but still, it's not a bad guess. 6 million in North America. So BC Place just down here, I did a little, uh, I consulted my friend Google earlier on capacity. BC Place over here where they had some Olympics where the uh, Whitecaps play, you could fill it 114 times, full, 114 times, with the number of people in North America alone who will get money this year for doing something online for someone else. For, for full disclosure, uh, we think that the number worldwide is 14 million. We think three years from now it'll be 28 million people. We make money, some full time, part time, that many people who are going to make money. Standing out in the crowd is extremely hard. That's why speciali specialization is key. Specialization is key is because people call in experts, they don't call in generalists. When your car breaks down, say you drive a Mercedes, um, you can take it to Mr. Lube and Mr. Lou might figure out why the transmission fell out on uh, the parkway, or you probably take the Mercedes dealership because they know what they're doing with Mercedes. Specialization is key because people are looking for expertise. Think of any service that you pay for, any service that you go after uh, uh, or that you utilize yourself. If you don't pick the best possible person out there, it's probably a function of price or a function of convenience of, of like getting an appointment, etc. but it at least crosses your mind for the important things. Okay? When you get sued, you don't go to the back of the yellow pages and find the cheapest lawyer who charges $13 an hour to take a lot, <laughs> right? You find the person who is the best resource for what you need. And web development design is, is no different at all. 
being, being a specialist, having a niche, having a place where you can be the best is key to standing out among the six million people in North America. Um, you want to work to be first on that list. Right? These things, I promise they're sort of big picture, we're going to narrow it down as we go. But you do want to find something where you can be uh, the expert. So I've got a couple examples here. So this is my friend Chris, I don't know if any of you guys know Chris Lima, he used to be the chief technologist at Crowd Favorite about four or five months ago, he sought out on his own. Uh, I actually talked to Chris, sort of the same question, how did you get into WordPress? He's been in, in enterprise software for a very long time. Uh, and he told me that he started going to WordCamps with friends maybe, wasn't that long ago, like four years ago, five years ago. And he noticed that there wasn't anybody uh, really focused on enterprise grade, account management, the procurement process, the tough stuff of actually selling a project to Pepsi or Facebook or Uber or companies like that. And he said that that was a corner with nobody on it, and so I took that corner. So that I didn't feel any great affinity at the moment to enterprise and WordPress. He's like, I just saw nobody was there. And so now Chris uh, has books. He, he basically now makes a living uh, consulting with web development, other web development companies with hosts, with enterprises, about making sure that the barn can get raised altogether because he's seen as a permanent expert of how to get big businesses who are stuck using things like .NET, uh, getting .NET out of Fortune 500s and getting WordPress in. Uh, he's the guy that makes it happen, and that's become a living for him. So he's he's the person people turn to for enterprise. The guy's at 10up. I don't know if you know 10up. It's a geo-distributed company. The CEO is in Boston. The guy that owns the company is in Sacramento. They've got dozens of people across the country. Uh, they do a bunch of stuff well. But a couple, three years ago when I was at WP Engine, um, I was talking to them, I said, what do you guys do best? What do you do best? What's the thing I can count on you? I've got dozens of agencies, dozens of developers always asking for leads, etc. What do you guys do best? And the owner told me, he says, we're better at HHVM than anyone. I thought that was a pretty curious answer, right? Because at the time, HHVM was a hip hop virtual machine, sort of, um, was sort of new. Uh, there hadn't been a lot of demonstration uh, around the utility of it. Um, people were thinking about PHP 7 coming out, and we focused on HHVM. 10up had just uh, done a redesign of TechCrunch. They launched Grantland in the previous years. They do work for News Corp. They do work for Time Magazine. So they've got these big publishing brands. And what they wanted to tell me they were best at was HHVM. And it cut through the noise, because then for the next six or eight months, every time somebody came to me and said, hey, we're interested in hip hop, I'd say, well, you should talk to the guys at 10up. Because I've already vetted it, and they do that really well. So they separate themselves by having that sort of specialization. Uh, Mode Effect is an agency, it's, based, it's actually a guy uh, named Cody Landfeld in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, he does some really nice videos about once or twice a week, he'll post a video uh, uh, about marketing your business, et cetera. I would encourage you guys to check out. But um, same thing, I asked Cody, I was like, what do you do well? He's like, he's like, we're great with nonprofits. He says, I understand how the budget and procurement process works with nonprofits. I understand the pain of getting dollars approved, but the, but the project running behind schedule. So, you know, I vetted some of that, worked with him on some of that, and, and come to find, yeah, like if, so, if a nonprofit contacts me, I'm like you should talk to Cody. Even if he's not the guy, he can put you in touch with the right people. And so since then, like um, there's a charity tournament that the PGA, uh, Professional Golf Association runs, that I've helped turn Cody on to, things like that, because having that specialization of what, what he does really well, same with Chris, same with the guys at 10up, has meant all the difference in the world, instead of just being like, oh, I can do whatever. I know WordPress, I'll do whatever. Well, Listen, you and 7,000 other people that I have stored in my phone, like, like cutting through the noise is of critical importance if you're actually going to try to leverage partnerships. Which brings us to, have you ever tried a partner network? And there's a big difference. Referrers are people that pass you opportunities out of need. Okay? It's a former customer. Maybe they think they're doing you a favor, but what they, you know, let's just say I'm a dentist, which would be scary for everyone. But I'm a dentist, and you built my website for me three years ago and I'm generally happy and my hosting bill is $6 over GoDaddy and everything seems to be good. And one of my dentist buddies says, hey, I need a website. Okay, well, you know what, somebody built me a website so I refer them over. It may feel like, you know, on the one hand, that is an implicit endorsement of your services and the work that you've done, but it's also that dentist serving himself well because he just put somebody in touch. He's like, hey, look what I know. I know somebody who's in web development. That's passing an opportunity out of need. Partners pass you opportunities out of want. Think about that. We're going to build a partner network. You're going to have the ability to build a partner network where people think of you because you are an expert, because you have cut through the noise. They say, Greg is the person who will do this best. Janet is the person who will do this best. And what's best for my client, what's best for the person I'm working with, is to refer them to Greg or to Janet. When I was talking earlier about migrations. How many people in here have ever done a WordPress migration for money? Okay, half a dozen of them, right? 
It is thankless and painful work, and in the end, there's still backlinks that don't work correctly, there's SEO that drops off, uh, the host blames you, your client blames the host, everyone's angry for three or four weeks, and then not much happens. Is that about how the process goes? That's exactly how the process goes. Okay. So now, from now on, whenever it comes, somebody comes to me and says, we need a migration, I say, you need to call my friend Josh at Fantastic. So he's going to do it for 100 bucks, and I'm not going to have to hear about it. Right? Because he's cut, he's cut out that that's his corner. That's what they do and they do well. And I can trust him with it. I send him things out of want because I was like, I know he'll do a great job for my client, and they'll be happy that they chose Media Temple, not because we screwed up their migration, but because I put him in touch with the guy that could do it well so that they could be happy Media Temple customers thereafter. So like I said, building a partner network, first and foremost, is about specialization. It means being the best in the world, and it means figuring out what business that you should be in. So if you're not sure right now, you should ask yourself, uh, ask yourself a few questions that we have here that will sort of hopefully bubble up some things so you can think about, you know, what is it that I do well? Where should I be the best in the world? Before we go much further, I want everybody to understand, being the best in the world doesn't mean being the best in the entire world. It's a lofty goal, but of course it, that feels very far out of reach. You can have your own world. You can say, I want to be the best plug-in developer in the greater Vancouver area. I want to be the go-to SEO expert in Deep Cove. I want everybody in Vancouver Island that wants to migrate to WordPress, I want them to think of me. Your world does not have to be very big. Pick a corner, no matter how small it is, and go out and, and win that corner. And then you can think about growing the pond, right? Growing the corner of the pond, mixing my metaphors. Um, but pick something where, where you want to go and be the best, where you feel like you're comfortable, you can be the best. Maybe being the best is, I want to be the least expensive web developer, so if somebody needs a site in three days for 100 bucks, I'm the guy. Or you can say, I only want to work with the biggest financial institutions that are located in downtown. Well, that's fine too. But pick, pick what it is you want to be the best at the world at, and then focus on it. So you know, what that should be first is you might want to ask, what do your best clients have in common? And by best, I mean the ones that pay well. I mean the ones that um, are happiest with your work. Uh, the ones that maybe do bring you the most referral business. You're, everybody should have in mind the best client, if only everybody was like Teresa. I have a thriving business. Okay, who, who are your best clients and what do they have in common? What do your favorite projects have in common? I hate migrations. I love converting to X, Y, Z. Finding that common thread, drawing your Venn diagram of what those things have in common will help you sort of figure out where you have a chance to be the, be the best in the world and also be happy doing it. What do others call on you for most often? If you've been doing this for any amount of time, you probably have received some referrals. You probably have received people calling and saying, hey, would you help me with this? That's not coincidence. They're calling you because they probably had a good experience with you on that specific thing in the past. Is there something that you get called about often that maybe you don't even recognize you're really good at? Hey, listen, would you, I realize this is an unglamorous, but like, hey, would you help us write some more blog posts? It might not even occur to you that you're a good writer. But that's a valuable skill. That is a valuable digital skill. Being able to write in 400 to 800 word increments with a little SEO optimization that doesn't bore people to tears, it doesn't have a high bounce rate, that is a valuable skill. And that's every bit as much a part of web development as building an Instagram club. What do others call you for most often? And what skills are bringing home the bacon? In the end, it is about money. Even if you're a freelancer, you want your time, uh, the time that you spend, to be worthwhile. Um, and, and for example, none of you would do this for a dollar a project. You'd all do it full time for a million dollars a project. So now we're just haggling over the price. What, uh, what's bringing home the bacon? What's making this worthwhile for you? Sort of listing those things out, or at least thinking about them some, will let you understand, like, okay, what business should I actually be in? Building partner network then comes with identifying partners. Uh, you, you don't want to be in the nightclub all by yourself. This is this looks at uh, uh, means looking at the ecosystem around you and thinking about um, who provides complementary services. Um, I feel bad because I did update that to spell complimentary correctly, and then I apparently didn't save it. So it should have another E, not an I. I'm aware of it. Uh, not a designer, but I can't spell. Um, so where can the clients benefit most? How many of you have ever brought somebody else in for your client while you were still doing the work, while you were in the process to say, this, this person, this SEO person should come in right now because they can help? Some of you, all of you, that's really good. Uh, that is uncommon. It's very uncommon. Most designers and developers worry about getting their work done and cashing the check, and then will worry about doing what's best for the client afterwards. I don't blame them. It's hard enough to focus on your own business. 
but your value becomes exponentially higher at any point in the process where you can let your clients know that you are helping their digital strategy, you're helping them make money above, above yourself, right? Um, for example, uh, one that I run into all the time is we run into publishers who come to us and they say, we really want to be in the cloud. We really want to be on AWS. But we're getting 3 million hits a month, 3 million uniques a month, and we can't afford the $2,000 entry point to get to AWS. And I'm like, that's because your ad tech is terrible. That's because you're using Google AdWords or AdSense, whichever one is. It's like, why don't I introduce you to Taboola? Why don't I introduce you to Outbrain? Why don't I keep working with you and then four or five weeks from now, your revenue will go up 3x and then you can pay for the bill to the cloud. Helps everybody. They're thrilled. They're like, wow, we're making tons of money. We just didn't even know that was an option. So where can your clients benefit the most? What services can make your work look even better? You do an awesome job redesigning something for somebody uh, and they say, this looks beautiful, but most of our traffic is coming from inside the office. Nobody's found our site. Has it occurred to you maybe in the process to work with an SEO firm? to work with somebody, um, let's say it's e-commerce. Have you thought, uh, not, to, not to be a, a, I love WooCommerce, but sometimes it's just easier to send people to Shopify. It doesn't make you a heretic, it just means you're doing what's right for your client. Uh, we had an example of that uh, before Christmas. We had, um, we launched Kylie Jenner's lip kit on Cyber Monday. And the designer developer, it was one guy, does excellent design, first thing out of his mouth is, I'm not a WordPress developer. Okay. So we had seven days to get on the cloud, something that was gonna be promoted across 41 million social media followers. And the guy's like, I'm not a developer. So what do we do? We say, the path of least resistance here is we're going to hack it to work on WooCommerce and then we're gonna find a strategy in the short term to get you over to Shopify so that you can focus on making the site beautiful and Kylie Jenner can make a bunch of money, right? And by doing that, it creates a stickiness with that entire business and everybody that interacted with that business to say that went off really, really well. Just to, to finish the story, we launched it on Cyber Monday. She had three different lipstick colors, 5,000 units each at 30 bucks a pop. 15,000, 30 bucks a pop, just under half a million dollars, sold out in 38 minutes and then we broke the site. So that they could go on Twitter and say she's more popular than her sisters. They were thrilled. Half a million dollars, we break the site, she's more popular than her sisters and now um, they're using Shopify in the back end, it's now a full cosmetics line, it's great, this, that, or the other. And anytime I hear that you know, somebody in that family or whatever has something big coming up or they need something, they call us. It's awesome. Doing what's right for the client. How can, how can, how can uh, those services make you look even better? Who do you already know? Did you meet somebody today? Have you worked with people in the past? Do you go to meetups? Have conversations, have cups of coffee. Hey, you know what, what do you do really well? I was really thinking about this. This is what I do well. This is what, uh-oh. This is what I do well. <laughs> Not holding microphones. How can we work together? Anybody here ever sold in tandem? Ever, anybody ever gone to a pitch meeting with a third party sitting next to you where the business is, is for both of you? Okay. Yeah. That's the sort of thing people people really enjoy as well. Um, I've got an example of that coming up that, that, that I think you guys like. And then who would you like to know? I mean, are you following lists on, on Twitter? Uh, are there people that you hear speak? Are there people that you say, I'd like to work with this person? I guarantee you, they want to work with you too. I promise. I promise. There's, not, there's enough business out there for everybody, and most of us don't have it. They all want to work with you too. If there's somebody that you think of as a mentor, somebody who thinks of you as a mentor, somebody who you admire their work ethic, somebody who you've seen come a long way, or they've seen you come a long way, who would you like to know? Those are people that can that can be that can provide the complimentary services and, and be your partner network. So who provides it? developers? That's pretty easy. Okay. So I know some other WordPress developers. Maybe I am over capacity, so I'm going to farm out this work to somebody. Um, SEO and SEM providers, um, designers themselves, content providers, marketers. Um, this is you know goes without saying. You know, if you work with somebody who is a marketing firm whether it's a company like Outbound Engine or Irrelevance or it's an individual who's doing marketing, if they're doing a good job, their clients are going to need more web work, right? They're going to need more microsites. They're going to need a redesign. They're going to need e-commerce. These are all people that are good to know, including the marketers. Some of the places where we have the best success, believe it or not, are with experiential marketers and event planners. Ford Motor Company, I, I didn't know anybody at Ford Motor Company until I met the person that puts all their booths together at Detroit Auto Show, and now I have a relationship with Ford Motor Company. Had nothing to do with digital, but it was certainly somebody that had a little bit of, of, a, of an overlap. Ad tech companies, um, 
I would encourage you guys, if you have, if you've worked on any sites at all that generate money through advertising, find somebody to know at Taboola, find somebody to know at Outbrain. There's half a dozen others that will have a massive, massive effect on your, your client's revenue. And I'm not talking like, oh, CPM went from nine cents to 12. I'm talking about three, four X. Your clients will make tons of money. They will send you Christmas cards for the rest of your life. People that work with other CMS, um, folks that work with Drupal, folks that work with um, you know, Adobe, CQ, whatever. There's a lot of businesses out there that don't just have all WordPress. I love WordPress as much as you guys do. Um, a guy named Steve Zingit at Seek Interactive, one of his favorite things to say is your clients don't care that you use WordPress, they care that you solve their problems. So as much as you work in WordPress, find people that work with other technologies. So the next time that you walk into Bank of Montreal or whatever for the biggest pitch meeting of your life and they say, we're sold on WordPress, but we also need somebody to integrate this third party API that's still running on .NET infrastructure again, you're not lost. You say, great, I've got a guy that does that. I've got a girl that does that. And then other tech providers, security companies, uh, like Security, for example, like Sidebuck, for example. These, these companies also have people who ask them for design and development help. And it's not just about you bring them leads and you hope that they throw one back over. It's about working together. It's about what's doing what's best for the clients and it's about finding your corner that you, that you own where you're the best in the world. So Logan at SiteLock thinks, I met this person at WordCamp Vancouver last week and they were telling me that the thing that they love best is making sure that older versions of plugins continue to resist vulnerabilities until such times they can be updated, et cetera. And then he calls you. They have needs also. Tech providers have needs. Hosting providers have needs. Um, the one thing about hosts uh, that I would, I would sort of caution you about is to make sure you want that specificity of what you do well, um, and you want to make sure that you're talking to the right person at a hosting provider. If you're talking to a salesperson at a hosting provider, I'll just level with you, they're looking for leads. Mm -hmm. They're not going to bring much back to you. Some of them will. Some of them can do a good job. The, the vast, if you call up Pantheon tomorrow, and you talk to somebody in sales, and you say, I'm a developer, I want to work together, they're going to be like, that's great, awesome, I'm so excited about us working together, Maria. And then they're going to email you asking you what you're working on and how they can set up hosting. Just so I have hosts at the bottom for a reason and I work for host. All these others are actually really good places to sort of farm relationships, farm ways that you can work with people, not send them leads, wait for them to come back. I'm talking about working with people to do what's best for the clients. So reaching out to these folks. Um, I actually think you can make 10 friends. I promise you if you make 10 friends utilizing this, you'll have more business than you know what to do with. We actually work on uh, a list of 100 where there's 70 that we're trying to cultivate a relationship with, there's 20 that we are sort of feel like are, are getting in the game, and then there's 10 that we rely on heavily. Um, if you can just work on the 10, don't spend all day, every day trying to cultivate the list. Find 10 people you want to work with. Find 10 people that can complement your skill set and keep up with them. If, it's, if it feels like a chore, once again, to reach out by phone or by email to keep up, you know, it's probably the wrong person of the 10. If it's somebody that you love to sit down with a cup of coffee and talk about, oh, this project was awesome. Oh, really? Let me hear all about that. Where'd you guys go on vacation? Like, your friends? I know all of you here already have friends that are developers, friends that are in technology. Widen your gaze. How can you guys work together? I have the best job in the world. I travel all over the country and I get to make friends. It's what I do for a living. It's amazing. And, and if you can get your headset around, your head around the fact that you can do that too, just go make friends. How do we work together? This is what I'm awesome about. Or this is what I'm awesome at. This is what I'm passionate about. You find other people the same way, you'll be shocked how fast the opportunities come for all of them. So reaching out and asking. Emails are okay. This includes LinkedIn, right? Um, if you want to build a network of 150 people that maybe think of you occasionally, email, LinkedIn, that's great. Um, I will say this as a sort of, as an aside, I get anywhere between 15 and 20 emails a day, cold emails from Data and I's and Discover Org and Sales Loft and all these people. You want to schedule them, you want to schedule them. And they may as well like write the message on a post-it note and throw it in the ocean because I don't pay attention to it. Um, anybody that calls me, I'll give them a demo. Anybody that calls me. Because I can call them once a month. Somebody will pick up the phone and call me. Say, we have this. I'm like, you know what? We probably aren't going to buy it, but I know you're going to get paid for this lead. Let's set up a demo just because you had the tax to call me on the phone. So phone calls are better. People love to talk about their business. You find somebody you want to work with, you pick up the phone, you call them at the office on a Tuesday, I promise you that if you say, listen, my name's Janet, I am a WordPress developer, here's what I do best. 
it looks like we might have something in common, I'd love to learn more about your work, they will stop what they were doing and they will talk to you. Guaranteed. People love to talk about their business, they love when people ask about their business, and they like the opportunity to make money too. If you find people you want to work with, pick up the phone and call them. Not a one of them is going to charge you to talk to them on the phone. Face to face is best. Which reminds me, you're at work camp. This is a great opportunity to meet people, especially in your area. Find somebody that you want to you want to work with and say, we're going to tackle nonprofits in North Vancouver. Anybody who wants to get on the web in North Vancouver who has a .org is coming to me and you. We're going to do this. And the reason is because I'm awesome at this and you're awesome at that, and that's perfect for that work. It's a, it's a wonderful way to, to amplify your skill set and bring more business. It's also a way to be held accountable. It's like going to the gym. If you have somebody who makes you go, if you have somebody else who it doesn't mean partnership. I'm not talking about starting a business with somebody. I'm talking about having somebody else who's like, hey, we have a goal. We should get to this goal together. Because it's better for both of us if we get to that goal together rather than standing still and not doing anything by ourselves. So here's, here's how you have those conversations. First and foremost, it's very easy. I have a client who would benefit from working with you. Can I make an introduction? I did this last week, uh, two weeks ago. We were just bringing over a company called One Live to uh, Media Temple to AWS Cloud. They use Shopify as their um, provider. It's a merchandising company. They do merch for about 700 artists, including Willie Nelson, Radiohead, Rihanna, some really big names. They handle all the merch, and they do it through Shopify. The guys at Rock Nation who use WordPress and use Media Temple uh, were telling me that they were having some struggles with um, their e-commerce solution. Their Magento guy was running behind schedule and over budget. They were starting to look at Shopify, but there were some limitations around what Shopify could do. I was like, I don't think there's limitations. You just don't know what you're doing. Let me introduce you to Chris over at OneLive. And so it made it easy for everybody when I called Chris and said, hey, there's somebody who could benefit from your work. Can I make an introduction? He's like, absolutely, positively, yes. Did this a week or two ago when I was in Manhattan, where Rock Nation's offices are, and now I can't get rid of both of them. Like, hey, what else are we working on? What can we do for you? It's amazing. Guy at Rock Nation, you want to go to the 4040 Club? I'm like, no, I'm not in Manhattan. He's like, okay, let me know if you need to get on the list. I'm like, how about you bring me some business? I think our services are a good fit. Let's find one project to work on together. This one is really powerful because it does put people to a decision. Whether it's an SEO company, it's an advertising company, it's a host, it's a CDN. Listen, guys, it. Fastly, guys at Sidewalk, guys at Cloudflare. I really like your service. I think there's a way we can package this together with what I do. Let's find one project to work on together. Let's talk in a week. I'm going to go find three clients that I think I can call, and you find three clients also. And let's pick a Tuesday and let's go into their offices together. You put people to a decision. I think our services are a good fit. Let's find a project to work on together. This is what I was talking about earlier, being a hosting provider, trying to help. Uh, Crowd Favorite is a, is a developer in Redondo Beach area, but they've got offices all around the world. Um, he contacted me, he said, hey, uh, we're going to do some internal work for Uber, and, we, uh, and we're up against some people that provide hosting and development services. I don't want to get in the hosting business. Why don't you come with me? Let's go talk to them. Let's find a project to work on together. And so selling in tandem, doing what's best for the clients, works out well for everyone. Instead of saying, like, we do everything, it's like, no, I'm bringing an expert in. Let me work for you for free. So uh, there's a company called Flowpress that's been in Toronto area. Uh, it's for the love of WordPress. And where the, their corner that they wanted to stand on is in DevOps. Is in app, they, you know, they can do creative, but what they really want to do is make sure the sites are optimized as they're going, uh, going forward um, through time. There's plugin updates, there's WordPress updates, there's security vulnerabilities, there's things that somebody should be minding the store about. And a lot of times when developers are done, they build a Ferrari and then they let the client park it out on the street. And Flowpress, the company, says, no, we want to put it in the garage and make sure it's taken care of. So he comes to us and he says, hey, by the way, Curves.com, anybody know what Curves is? Work out and put something Curves.com is down. It's like, okay. He's like, and that's at Media Temple. I was like, oh, okay, now I'm interested, right? <laughs> Didn't know that. Um, and so he says, we've been monitoring it. Curves.com is down. Um, you should call them. And by the way, it's down because they're using too much memory. Uh, we can tell that. And so if it comes to pass, maybe you should tell Curves.com that Flowpress can help them with that problem. So my first inclination is to, solve, to make sure our client gets back online. Maybe they need to, to be on a different type of VPS. Uh, Maybe they need to be in the cloud. But yeah, I'm going to think about uh, I'm going to think about the fact that some DevOps work would help that. So you know, Ben's done me a solid by giving me this piece of information for free. I'm going to go track it down, and then Ben is going to uh, possibly get some DevOps work. We look in our system and we find that Curves.com, through their partnership with Ginny Craig, is actually being administered by the marketing department of Ginny Craig which is a much bigger operation than Curves.com. 
And so now we're having conversations with Ginny Craig about doing uh, some new cloud-based stuff for them. Ben at FlowPress is now has DevOps work with Ginny Craig and with Curves. Um, it was an amazing, amazing uh, gamble by him, so to speak, to say, hey, listen, let me do this for free. So now, frankly, he sends over reports to me almost weekly of clients that we have that could be optimized. It's great. I get to have conversations, make our clients happy, and if we get around to talk about DevOps, then Ben gets something out of it. And then finally, um, you have what I need. Let's talk first. I had a client a oh, year or two ago um, who was trying to integrate some WordPress stuff with some Ruby on Rails. And I have a cursory enough knowledge of Ruby on Rails to understand uh, that I don't know anything about Ruby on Rails. And so, <laughs> so I started doing some research. I started asking around. I found this company uptrending in the Bay Area uh, that actually has picked their corner to be, we do WordPress and Ruby on Rails. Who figured, right? Uh, and sure enough, it worked out great. I called them and I said, I've got somebody who, who, who could use your services, but I need to know more. I need to understand a bit more about how you guys came to own this part of the world. Uh, and it's become a really nice relationship. Do I have a lot of clients that call for that integration? No. Does it happen? Yes. And when it does, I call up to Because I know that they're really good at it. I bet most of you in this room could probably figure out how to hack around Ruby on Rails with WordPress and we could get the job done. It's just easier for me to call up training because I've already worked with them and I know they do it and they told me that that's what they're best at. So there's a few reasons of why you're not going to do this. Because um, it, it, it's easy to go to conferences, to go to work camps and get excited about what you've heard and learned and then go home and sort of start to forget it, right? Reasons being as first is the status quo is easier. Um, doing what has gotten you here is probably the path of least resistance. And I understand that. Um, to build your business in any way, uh, at all requires having some focus and having some, some intensity around doing it. You don't have to have the business rigor uh, that no one likes, but going back and saying like, at a minimum, I want to figure out what I'm best at, and I want to let that be my story. If nothing else, I would encourage you to do that. Status quo can change, and it should. When you're here, you're spending your valuable time on a Saturday away from friends and family, away from Stanley Park, to uh, learn more about what to do with WordPress and because you came here I'm assuming you want more clients you want more business so please do go home and think about how you can change the status quo if only in that little way what am I really good at getting out of the anything for a buck business the other is that there's too much work to do I applaud you there's too much work to do today in two or three weeks there won't be too much work to do um, that's the cycle that we talked about earlier you don't know where to look uh, if you want any suggestions any advice on who you can be talking to uh, my Twitter handles in there you can find me on the side I love talking about this stuff if any of you ever wanted to say, listen, I would really like to be the best person in Boise, Idaho, that works on sports websites. I'd love to help you be that person. Um, there's other people in this room who would love to talk shop with you about, hey, what, what is it you're good at? Tell me about that. Oh, like, don't let that, don't, don't let a lack of knowledge or an ignorance to how you can build out a partner network stop you from doing it. There are people with far, far fewer resources who have figured it out. And then finally, you're already the big fish. Um, which I find hard to believe because um, the idea that you have too many leads and too much business has never been said by anyone. Um, not with any honesty. I mean, all of you who are freelancers here, how many of you would love to, and maybe this is your plan, maybe it's not, how many of you would love to be doing great work at your own shop of three or five or 15 or 20 people doing awesome and fun stuff? It's a pretty good amount, right? The news is it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen through just wanting. You do have to do some things, and I'm hopeful that some of this in here has shown you that there are easy ways to generate more business. Don't spend any money on pay-per-click. Definitely don't do that. Remember that part. Um, does anybody know who James Altucher is? Yeah, one, okay. We have just a few minutes left, and I am almost done. I'll admit about some, uh, some other things. Um, but one of the things that, that he said uh, that stuck with me is his favorite thing to do. He says, my favorite thing to do is to introduce two people who can make each other money and then see myself out of the room. So if nothing else, if you feel like partner, building a partner network is helpful or can be helpful to your business, and I promise you that it is, if, you, if none of this, anything else has resonated, do try to remember that. There's a lot of power in putting two people in touch with each other who can help each other and then seeing yourself out the door. It is like planting a garden that grows forever. Um, think about that the next time somebody says, can you do this, you know, uh, this plugin development for me? Maybe that's not your thing. Maybe the answer in your heart of hearts is, no, I'm not really good at that, but I'm in anything for a buck business. Get out of that business and get in the business of doing what's right for the client. Introduce them to the person you know who's awesome at that and see yourself out the door. Mm -hmm. Both of them. 
We'll love you forever. And that, that sort of thing just, just built itself. Um, while you're here in Vancouver, uh, I, I live in Austin, Texas. I actually do get to spend a fair amount of time here, which uh, I really love the city. Um, if you need any activities, um, the Grouse Grime, there's a Picasso exhibit at the museum right now, <coughs> Fly Over Canada, Capilano, Suspension Bridge, Stanley Park Aquarium. Anybody in here ever done the Grouse Grime? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. All right. That's like the worst thing I ever did. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's difficult. I was like, by the end, I was like lifting, I was like using my arms to lift my legs. For those of you who don't know, it's uh, about three kilometers long and it changes elevation 2,800 feet in three kilometers. It's not, um, it's not a hike so much as it's a, a torture chamber on the side of a mountain. It's fantastic though. It takes about an hour or so. It's awesome at the top. Anyway, uh, dinner, there's some places that are good. Drinks, there's some places. I know that we have the, the after party at the road, but there's some, if you guys are from out of town and you want to spend some time here, that's my list. I felt like being a tour guide, even though I've lived further from here than just ever. <laughs> Any questions? Is that comprehensive? Wow. Very good. Uh, what are some ways that people kill partnerships? Um, uh, by, it's a great question. The question was, what are ways people kill partnerships? Um, my experience has been the first way that people kill partnerships is um, thinking about it and what's in it for them all the time. Partnerships should have a mutual understanding that we're both trying to be successful here. I'm not carrying all the water, uh, but being too specific about what, what's in it for me, what's in it for me, what's in it for me, is a great way to kill partnerships. Um, I, I feel like I'm good at sales because I spent a long time being really bad at it, and uh, I was really bad at sales because I spent my days trying to figure out what was gonna put the most money in my pocket. Um, and once I sort of abstracted my paycheck from the fact that if I just show up to work and do a good job, that's, that part solves itself, it's a lot the same way in partnerships. If you think about, okay, what are we gonna to do to make the clients happy? What are we gonna to do to create more stickiness? What are we gonna to do to create more value for everyone? Let's figure out how to grow a bigger pizza. So even if I only get one slice, it's a bigger slice. Um, and that's why I was saying only a little bit tongue in cheek that if you're working with hosting providers and you call the sales guy at Rackspace, yeah, I'd love to have a partnership with you. You're gonna get emails every two weeks. What are you working on to any hosting? And that's not a partnership. You're gonna start email. How do you end client relationships amicably? How do I end the client relationships amicably? Sometimes the person who you got the business from is no longer there. Yep. Other people come in, it's still the website or whatever, and you don't want to work with that person or because things change. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the question is about ending relationships with clients. There's, there's a couple of different ways that relationships end. I think your question, your, your, your question is more around like, hey, this is no longer a good fit. Right. Okay. Um, there's also reasons that um, that's two-way street. Sometimes they think the client no longer thinks it's a good fit, and sometimes you don't think it's a good fit. Uh, my sort of rule of thumb when ending any sort of relationship, whether we have a person that spends just a few dollars a month to turn out or we have a high-value client, is I want people to be disappointed it didn't work out, not angry it didn't work out. And if you can sort of get your head around, being honest with people, like, listen, my, it's totally fine to say my skill set is no longer what you need, but I can introduce you to somebody. Or to say, you know, you would never say, listen, Greg, you're an a-hole and I don't feel like working with you anymore. <laughs> but, uh, but you can say, you know, the environment has changed. My skills aren't aligning with your strategy. Um, I don't feel like I can be successful with you anymore. There's nothing wrong with having a dose of humility. There's nothing wrong with being a little self-deprecating or self-effacing around it um, to get out of an unfortunate relationship. Because in the end, you want that person to say, gosh, you know, we really liked working with John. And over time, it didn't work out. But, but in the same context, I wouldn't hesitate to recommend John to somebody else. And it should be the same for you. You know, Clients can be difficult. Um, everyone, everyone's had a difficult client at least, right? If not, wait a couple hours, at some point we'll have a difficult client. And, um, and extracting yourself from that, uh, one, it's good to do that because you don't want to be in business with bad clients because it's